this is what's considered a standard demographic profile. Children at the bottom, young adults, mature adults, retirees at the top, men on one side, women on another. Uh, this is what most of the world looked like before the industrialization wave that occurred after World War II. But with globalization, this all changed because it used to be that we all lived on farms and you would have as many kids as you could put up with because they were free labor. Well, as many kids as you could put up with plus one because that's how you find out it's too many kids. But when you take an industrial job, which international trade made possible, those were all in the cities. And as you move off the farm and into the cities, uh, you have fewer of them because kids go from being a free, free source of labor to a massive expense and headache. And over the ages, the Korean demographic has shifted to this. The whole world has gone with the Koreans, starting from different points, going at different paces, but this has changed the economic structure of the world because when you're a young system like this, it's all about raising kids and buying homes and buying cars and going to college. Young people do all of the spending in a modern economic system. That tends to make it very inflationary. But an older system like this, it's all about the high value added workers who are doing everything they can to save for retirement. They've got decades of work experience. Their incomes are high. Their kids have moved out. So their expenses are low and they're generating a lot of spare capital for whatever they need to do. What is going on right now is the world is changing from this to whatever is next. This was always the decade when a huge chunk of the world's advanced economies were gonna age from this structure like Korea is today into the next structure, which is one where we have more and more retired people, where that bulge that has defined economic existence going back to the 50s moves into a non-economically viable state. So if a young demography is inflation-driven and growth-driven, and a more mature state like Korea today is investment-driven, technology-driven, infrastructure-driven, then whatever's next can't have consumption or production or capital because retirees are sitting on their capital in the form of T-bills and cash. They're no longer working, so there's no consumption and there's no production. We all make that shift at different times, but for most of the advanced world, this is the decade it all goes down. Give you an idea of what the neighborhood looks like. Let's start with the United States. We've got the healthiest demographic structure in the world. That doesn't mean it's perfect. You can see the bulge of the baby boomers in their 60s. So we're going through the same aging process as everyone else and digesting the boomers is going to be painful. But we also have the millennials down below who are rounding out the labor force in a way that is allowing us to have a more inflation driven system as opposed to deflation. You'll also notice that there's that big gap in the roughly five to 10 year olds. That is a mix of two things or three things. Number one, that's the uh, Gen Xers kids. Small generation generates a small generation. Number two, it's the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis. When people aren't sure of their prospects, they tend to have fewer kids. And third, it's the millennials doing everything that everyone has ever done before them, just with a six year delay. And so that was kind of the bottoming out of the birth rate. You'll notice it's already coming back and preliminary data for 2022 and 2023 looks very positive. So we are looking at that base widening out again. But these shifts, these uh, ins and outs of the demographic structures, they're actually going to be the single biggest factor that is shaping the labor force, our capital markets, and our economic structure for the next 50 years. And that shouldn't be a surprise to anyone because that's how it's been so far. The same holds true in Japan on the whole demographics shape destiny. But here it's just that the birth rate has been so low for so long, they're well past the point of any sort of demographic regeneration. About all I can say that's positive for Japan is they've seen this coming and they've done some planning. Automation in life, not in manufacturing, in life is more advanced in Japan than it is in any other places. They have robotic nurses, they've got hospital beds that turn patients. A lot of the stuff that doesn't require a lot of brains but doesn't necessarily require eyes and hands has been automated. And that's allowed Japan to age relatively gracefully. 
in addition, the Japanese, while they can't accept migrants because they have such a firm sense of culture, they have been able to expand spending on things like childcare and healthcare to encourage young families to have more children. It's met with some success. And so Japan, while it is still the oldest demographic structure on earth today, it's no longer the most rapidly aging. It's still in the top 10, don't get carried away. But Thailand, Korea, China, and Germany, and Italy are all aging faster, which brings us to Germany. This was always going to be Germany's last decade as an industrial power. They're aging too fast. They missed the point to turn the demographic ship of state 40 years ago. And they just haven't had much luck with immigra immigration. Uh, in the 90s, they were able to bring in roughly a million people from the former Yugoslavia. That helped. And then about 10 years ago, they brought in about a million people from Syria. The problem with the Syrian refugees, once you move past the cultural disconnect, is that these people were unskilled labor and they were 85% male. They didn't bring their families with them. And so it's a shot in the arm, yes, but it's no assistance for long-term demographic regeneration. There is a hope perhaps that they'll be able to pick up about a million Ukrainian refugees who are relatively highly skilled, it would be an easier carry to culturally integrate them. But at this point, the demographic decline is so far advanced that by 2030, the Germans will no longer have the workforce that's necessary to do the things that we associate with Germany. And that assumes nothing else goes wrong. Nothing with Euro, nothing with relations with the United States in terms of trade, nothing with the Russians in terms of energy. And all of that is going wrong too. And then finally, we get the People's Republic of China. Now this is already one of the fastest aging workforces in history ever. It's actually faster than the collapse of the workforces during the Black Death, during the Middle Ages in Europe. We also know that this is not the correct data. Uh, only about two, three weeks ago, the Chinese released updated data that has since been incorporated into this graphic, showing that the birth rate has just collapsed. Uh, since 2017, between 2017 and 2021, the birth rate dropped by 40%. And that's before you consider the anecdotals we have out of China of what went down with the COVID crash, suggesting that it's fallen even further. So we're already in a situation where we have roughly half as many children as we, I'm sorry, children five and under as we have children aged 10 to 15, which is well past terminal. It was already past terminal, but this is, you're looking at ethnic dissolution here with this sort of trend. And that assumes this data is accurate. The Shanghai Academy of Sciences is publicly trying to stir up discussion about how, because of the one-child policy, people have been over-reporting births and under-reporting different statistics, especially when it comes to labor, in order to make the local provinces look better. And they estimate that the Chinese system actually has 100, fewer, 100 million fewer children than the data officially suggests. That probably means that that big gouge in the lower chunk actually plays up higher within the demographic structure. And those yellow bars probably don't exist at all. This is not a country in demographic decay. This is a country in the advanced stages of demographic collapse. And we don't have an economic theory as a species for what might make this work. It's obvious from the data that the Chinese have shared that consumption led growth will never happen in China again. They actually saw a collapse in things like car sales back before COVID. They've never rebounded. And now with the, um, the piss poor recovery we've seen post COVID in China, we now know that consumption is not part of the equation. This graphic indicates part of why. And we also know that while their labor costs have gone up by a factor of roughly 14 since the year 2000, their worker productivity has barely doubled in most sectors and it's reached only triple in some of the more advanced ones. China is no longer the low cost environment for manufacturing. It's just the place where all the industrial plant happens to be. Now that's not nothing, but that's not enough to justify a long-term investment in the system. And every subsector that has tried to reshore out of China has, has discovered shorter supply chains with more effective labor, with lower energy costs, less political risk, closer to the end consumer. China's one-child policy is often held up as the pinnacle of what can happen when a government is willing to pair demographic concerns with a complete disregard for individual rights. 
In a few short years, strict enforcement slashed the birth rate, preventing an estimated 200 million to 400 million births and heading off the overpopulation problem that policymakers so feared. Now the success of that policy means the end of the Chinese system. There are many legitimate criticisms of one child. Forced abortions, the ability to buy government approval to flaunt the policy, the concept that the government can choose who can reproduce when, a massive sex imbalance in a culture that prefers sons to daughters, all these and more have twisted Chinese culture in awkward and painful directions. But the real problem with one child is that it worked. During the period from 1979 to 2003 when it was strictly enforced, the birth rate dropped by half. That slashed everything from health care to education to food costs. But it gutted the most recent generation. After three decades of the policy, there has been a European-style hollowing out of the younger segments of the population. This presents China with three unavoidable and system-killing problems. First, China is aging far more quickly than it is getting rich. At the beginning of China's international resurgence in 1990, the average Chinese citizen was only 24.9 years old, and the country boasted some 350 million citizens aged 15 to 29. It was this simple circumstance that allowed for China's massive manufacturing boom in the 1990s and 2000s. China was the world's ultimate source of cheap labor, and no other developing country could compete with the Chinese on price. Fast forward to the present, and courtesy of one child, the average Chinese is now 37, just a shade younger than Americans who are currently 37.3 years old. The Chinese will pass the Americans in average age in 2019, and by 2030 will be 42.9 years old versus 39.6 for the Americans. The Chinese call it the 4-2-1 problem. Four grandparents to two parents to one child. China is not yet wealthy enough to be able to try to afford a pension system like the advanced democracies which places the onus of caring for the elderly on their descendants, of whom there are precious few. In terms of relative numbers, the financial cost of the one-child policy is more than double the comparative costs that the Americans face from the boomer retirement. And the Americans already have a social security system in place to absorb some of the cost. The burden of having to financially support their elderly has a catastrophic impact on young workers' professional and financial development, reducing educational opportunities, gutting consumption, and all but making savings impossible. In China's specific situation, not only will this factor alone freeze in place China's efforts to switch its economy from exports to internal consumption and stymie its efforts to move up the value-added scale, but it will also prevent the sort of savings that makes the force-fed finance model possible in the first place. Second, China will never be able to move away from its current export-driven model. Recall what roles each age group carries out in society from an economic point of view. Young workers do the consuming that generates economic growth. The last baby boom that China experienced was in the 1980s just as one child was picking up. And China has suffered from an intentional baby bust ever since. Those boom babies are now aged 25 to 29 and are very visible as a bulge in China's population pyramid. It may be only a five-year increment, but it represents about 125 million people. This group's consumption is the primary reason why China appears to be succeeding somewhat in its current efforts to switch from an export-led to a consumption-led economy. But, again, courtesy of one child, their successors are ever smaller population cohorts. So congratulations are due to China for having impressive consumption growth in recent years. But that consumption growth has never beat out investment and loan-driven activity and is now nearly played out. Third, so too is the Chinese development model. Simple aging has already reduced China's pool of young, mobile workers by over 40 million during the last decade. And because of the baby bust, that decline is about to accelerate greatly. Put simply, China has run out of surplus labor. 
Its presence on the low-cost side of global manufacturing has run its course. This is already reflected in Chinese labor costs, which have sextupled since 2002. Looking forward just 25 years, China faces a far darker financial future than Europe and a far darker demographic future than Japan. I normally caution people I speak with about drawing forward linear trends. For example, the idea that China, or before it, the Soviet Union, or Japan, will soon rule the world. But demography is different. Young workers simply do not magically appear. They have to be born and raised. It takes 20 years to grow a 20-year-old. Well, 20 years and 9 months if you want to be exact. Changing a demography requires a broad-scale shifting of cultural and economic trends, and then holding the change for decades. Simply abolishing one child is only one step of the process. China would then need to encourage the young workers who are crammed into apartment housing to produce multiple children while still working and taking care of their parents and grandparents. It would have to build out an entirely new series of social services in health and child care whose absence provided the spare capital that helped make China's manufacturing boom possible. Even if we assume that China can pull this off, and an immediate abolition of the one-child policy leads to an immediate doubling of birth rates, which would be unprecedented in human history, it would still be two decades before China would begin to benefit from an expansion of the labor pool in any significant manner. That's two decades during which the rest of the Chinese population would still be aging toward retirement. Two decades during which China won't have much internal consumption going on. Two decades during which the low-cost, export-led model would still not work.